Good morning, everyone. How are you? I have I've really looked forward to uh, bringing this message. I've been like a kid waiting for Christmas this morning. I was up bright and early, ready to deliver. So uh, looking forward to it. Hey, I just want to bring you an update on our stewardship um, uh, offering that we uh, had a couple of weeks ago. Um, I love the fact that this is a generous and a giving church, and uh, it was great to hear the amount that was raised through the bake sale for the kids last week. But uh, as you know, we've been uh, um, uh, gaining commitments and raising funds towards our three-year stewardship campaign to do a stack of things here in the auditorium, new lights and a uh, whole stack of things that we need to do. And so, uh, so far, um, it's continuing to grow. We have 184 couples and individuals who have committed $328,000 so far, which is fantastic, isn't it? And uh, so grateful to God uh, for that. Also, um, 65,000 of that has already come in in cash in the offering, so uh, which is great. That enables us to start uh, doing some of the purchases uh, um, that we need to make. Um, and there's still time to join in on that. So if for some reason you hadn't been around in June, you weren't be able to put your commitment in, uh, our ushers have some of these little... Uh, uh, packs at the door, and uh, you can get those. It tells you all the information. You can read through it and um, and still be a part of that, which is fantastic. Life in the spirit. I love the graphic for for this series. Uh, there's so much in there that just speaks to me of the spirit. Um, there's so many symbols. The spirit is like a, a river, a source. That, that flows in our lives. Sometimes it's like a presence. It's like a misty presence. He's there in the mountaintop experiences and he's there with us in the valleys. But who is the Holy Spirit? Well, it's a good question. And uh, I think the Holy Spirit, it's probably fair to say, is the most, uh, or sorry, the, the least understood person of the Trinity. That's probably a fair statement. He is sometimes described as a force or a ghost or a ghoul. It's kind of, woo. He's often confused with the manifestations of the Spirit rather than the person and the personal work of the Spirit. Some people are genuinely afraid of the supernatural and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and our minds can sometimes be closed off to the possibilities of that. Alternatively, sometimes some Christians, they can be a little bit super spiritual, you know what I mean? And they're so open to the Spirit that they interpret anything that happens as the work of the Spirit. It's like, you know, I woke up this morning and I felt, God, tell me, just have one piece of toast. <laughs> and I went out to the kitchen and there was one piece of bread there. Now, that could be the work of the Spirit. It's more likely that somebody else just ate the rest of the loaf of bread, you know? <laughs> We're talking this morning about being open to the Spirit. When you're closed off to something, you shut off, you're in denial, you don't want to listen, you don't want to look, you don't want to see the evidence, you don't want to think about it, you are closed off to possibility. But if you're open, your senses are taking information in it's not that you abandon your senses it's you're taking information in so what are you doing you're watching you're listening you're smelling tasting touching you're getting the information in there you're thinking you are rationalizing and drawing conclusions if you're open to something and it's the same with spiritual senses and that's why we're doing this series life in the spirit because we want to see people not just get over the line for Jesus. We want to see people free and walking in freedom. And you need the power of the Spirit to do that. And that's why we're doing this series. And in two weeks' time, July 21st, we're going to have what we call an encounter time. So on that Sunday afternoon, 1.30 through to 3, because sometimes we're a bit limited for time in our services. We've got lots of stuff we want to do and there's family stuff going on. So, um, But we don't want to rush this. So on the 21st, if you've either been seeking baptism in the Spirit or you're needing just an in re-infilling of God's Spirit, then we encourage you, put that in your diary. July 21st, uh, 1.30 to 3, we'll be in here. 
and, uh, and we'll just be a time of worshipping, praying, spending time in the Spirit and really looking forward uh, to that. And in preparation for that, you can do a couple of things. One is... You can grab Pastor Bill's little booklet on baptism in the Spirit, which is excellent little uh, booklet. I was just um, reading it through again recently. Uh, plenty of copies of those out in the foyer and uh, on the bookshelf out there. So grab that, read it through, be, be reflecting. Uh, again, being open and, and taking that information in. Um, another book, this one you can uh, purchase, which is available off the CRC website, Rediscovering the Supernatural by Pastor Ian Miller. Um, uh, that one, uh, Ian was a pastor here for, for many years and then went and uh, led a church in Sydney. And this is his journey of, of the Holy Spirit and, uh, and his experience, which is excellent. So get a couple of those resources uh, in preparation if this is something that you want to get informed on. So, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity. And just like a person, he has feelings. He has intentions. He loves us. He communicates with us. He testifies. He teaches. He was present in Jesus' life. I think at every moment he was there at his baptism. It says the Spirit kind of descended upon him like a dove from heaven. It was there in his ministry. It was evident Jesus Still needed the, the power of the Spirit as he prayed for people, as he healed, as he did miracles. And I think the Spirit was there with him at his death on the cross and at his resurrection. It's the same Spirit that works in the lives of all believers. All who put their faith in Jesus have access to the Holy Spirit. It's what unifies the body of Christ. It's the power source for evangelism and for miracles and for Christian living. And this is really important. The Holy Spirit is looking for a relationship with us. That might be a revelation to some of you here this morning who have never thought about the Holy Spirit in that way. The Holy Spirit is looking for a relationship with you and with you and with you and with me and with all of us. It's not about religious formulas, about singing the best worship songs and praying at the right times. Those are good things, but we don't switch the spirit on and off like a light switch. We have to build a relationship with him. So, if you're going to be open to the spirit, there's a few things you can do. And we're going to uh, have a look at a story from Acts chapter 10 this morning. So if you've got a Bible or Bible app, uh, flick over to Acts 10. And we'll have the key verses up here um, just uh, in a second. You can take that off for the moment. Um, there's a few things that you can do to be open to the Spirit. And the first thing is, is you had to let faith overcome your fears. That's a very simple kind of statement. Um, but let me elaborate a little bit. Now, Cornelius and is a key character in this Acts 10 passage. He was a centurion. So he's in charge of 100 soldiers in the Roman army. And he was fit. He was a strong leader. He was a figure of authority. But more than that, he was devoted to God. At some point, he has encountered and had an experience where he found faith in God and wanted to please God, live life to please God. He had a healthy fear and a reverence for God. And not just that, but he led his family to be the same and, and do the same. It says he was a generous giver. We've talked about generosity uh, here this morning. He was very generous. It says he gave to anyone who had need. He was the kind of person that would, walking down the street, if he saw a need, he'd give to it. If someone said, asked him for something or said, wow, well, I'm, I'm really in need of such and such, he would help provide it. It says he prayed regularly. In fact, later on in the scripture, it says that his prayers had come up as, a, as an offering before God. I reckon they were pretty incredible prayers that he prayed. They weren't just God help me prayers or Lord help me get over the line prayers. I think they were faith-filled, God-honoring prayers. 
He was a good guy and he was open to the things of God. And God saw all of this and he wanted to reward Cornelius and his family. And so uh, one afternoon, about three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Cornelius is going about his business and he has a vision. And he's awake, but he sees something in the supernatural. And what he sees very clearly is an angel who comes up to him and calls his name. Now, I don't know what you would be like if an angel came up to you and called your name. It would probably freak you out. Like, can you imagine this? He's there going about his business, and this angel comes up and says, Cornelius. I don't know if angels actually talk like that. I'm just doing that for dramatic effect. So this angel comes up to him and calls him by name. And have a look what it says. Verse 4, Cornelius stared at him in fear. Fear doesn't even go towards actually what, what that means in, in the original Greek. What it actually meant was like he was paralyzed with fear. He couldn't move. He was so freaked out, as you would be. And so he's like, what is it, Lord? And the angel says to him, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. See, God had been watching over Cornelius. He had noted his faithfulness. He had noted the prayers. He had noted the generosity. And he wanted to move in this man's life. Now, Cornelius could have responded in a a range of ways. His fear could have overcome him at this point. He was paralyzed with fear, but this was critical. If he'd let his fear overcome him, then none of what would come after would have happened. And if he denied or told himself that, well, this is just my imagination. Did I really see an angel? Maybe it was just a trick of the light and I was hearing things and my wife was calling out to me. Like He could have rationalized it away and just said, no, I don't think I saw an angel. Then he would have missed out on the incredible move of the spirit that was going to take place. I wonder how often we do that, that we miss what the Spirit is doing. So often there are little things, and you might just kind of go, oh, that was a bit weird, and move on. I mentioned Pastor Ian Miller there, something that Ian does, and I love the way he he looks at this. He says, I often like to dialogue with the Spirit. So if something happens, afterwards I'll kind of, I'll just sit down and kind of say, Holy Spirit, can you you know, can we just talk? What happened there? What was that about? Was there something that you were trying to show me? And, uh, and sometimes he doesn't get anything at all. Other times it's like, oh, okay. Actually, Lord, you were pointing this out so that this could happen. And, and he gets revelation from it. It's a great habit uh, to do if you're open to hearing from the Spirit. Well, what happened to Cornelius? So the angel tells him a very clear message. The angel says, I want you to pick a couple of your best men, send him to a place called Joppa, and bring back a man called Peter, and I want you to listen to everything he says. That's a pretty specific word. That's not not vague. That's pretty specific. And Cornelius could have had a, a range of responses. He could have doubted. He could have questioned. He could have watered it down. He could have said, "Uh, well, maybe this is real, but I'm going to go myself because if I tell anybody else this, they're going to think I'm a bit wacky. Do you know what he did? He obeyed. He followed exactly what the angel said. He called three men together who he trusted, a couple of his soldiers and a friend. And he told them the whole story of everything that happened. And he says, I want you guys to go to Joppa which is about 60 kilometers south of, of Caesarea. And uh, so for us, it's like, it would be like going from here down south to, say, Selix Beach or Aldinga, that kind of distance, which in, for us is one hour in the car, right? But for those guys, they're most likely on foot. Um, so it would have been a minimum of 12 hours walking and probably taking breaks in there. So if they set off at 3 o'clock in the afternoon... Maybe stop for a few hours, sleep in there during the dark, up again. They don't get to Peter until about midday the next day. Cornelius could have responded in a a range of different ways, but he didn't let his fear paralyze him. He stepped out in faith. 
And when we step out in faith, God steps in with his power. Amen? The disciples of Jesus had to learn this along the way. They, they took a little while to get there, right? So um, if you think about the story when they were in a boat with Jesus and there's a storm... And they were totally freaked out. They let their fear overwhelm them. And the only thing they could think to do was wake Jesus up, who was sleeping in the back of the boat. And so they go and wake him up. And Jesus calms down the storm. Now, I suppose that's a good response, isn't it? To kind of, when all else fails, you go to Jesus, right? Except all else hadn't failed. The guys actually hadn't exercise their own faith in this matter. And so Jesus says to them, this is in Luke 8, verse 25, he goes, Guys, where is your faith? And in fear and amazement, they all looked at each other and went, like, who is this guy? He even commands winds and the water and they obey him. They thought that that was just completely impossible. Their minds were closed off to the possibility that they could have done it. And they weren't quite there yet. I suppose in that sense, they couldn't have done it. But they missed the point. Jesus was saying, hey, guys, if you have faith... You can do that too. Another example is, is uh, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. Um, uh, Timothy was a, was a younger ministry. Paul had prayed for him as a little boy and had, had seen him grow up. And, uh, and Paul was writing to him and, and saying, Don't doubt the call of God on your life and the work of the Spirit in your life. It was there in your mother and in your grandmother and it's there in you. And do you know what? It's still there. It's there in some of you here today. The call of God is on your life. It's just that sometimes we doubt it or we water it down or we put it to one side and think, yeah, okay, well, maybe I'll come back, come back to that. Have a look at what Paul said. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. This is Paul writing to Timothy. Fan it into a flame, the gift of God. Don't let it go down to a little ember. If it's there, by faith, stoke it up. You've got a gift, use it. Nathan Rigney has a gift in songwriting. He stirred it up and produced that beautiful song that we sang this morning. If you've got a gift, stir it up and use it. Some of you have gifts in hospitality, in opening your homes. You are very capable of leading something like an alpha group in your home. You think, oh, well, gee, I don't talk that good, so I could never get people saved. Nonsense. Open up your home, put on a meal, watch the videos, have a discussion around a few questions, and let the Spirit of God do the rest. Whew. Fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, or some translations say does not make us fearful. God did not give you a spirit of fear. Some of you need to claim that and own it this morning. God did not give you a spirit of fear. There are things in the natural that we may be fearful of, but that does not come from God. The spirit that God gives is one of power and love and self-discipline, or some translations say a sound mind, sharpened thinking. So it's a spirit of power. It's a power for healing, power for, for prophetic words, wisdom, insight, power for overcoming in your own life. It's a spirit of love to love others, and to be generous and kind. And it's a spirit of a sound mind. It's not about abandoning our senses. I said that before. Sometimes think people think, oh, Holy Spirit, is that you know, giving over my control and just letting something take over me? No. It's actually about fine-tuning those senses. So in my experience, I feel like as I've grown in the Spirit, I would hope I've grown more wise, I've had more insight into things, I have more understanding, I have more empathy, I have more love for people. Some of those things just come with maturity, but some of those things are also the work of the Spirit, magnified in our lives. Don't let fear paralyze you. Step out in faith and let God step in. So let faith overcome your fears. Something else you can do is you have to let love overcome any prejudice or bias you have. This is, this is getting nitty gritty now. So there's another character in this story, which is the Apostle Peter. 
So Pete is 60 kilometres away at his friend's house in Joppa. Uh, it's about 12 noon the next day. He's, he's quite hungry. He's, he's a little bit on edge and he's waiting for lunch and he's pacing up and down while he's waiting for lunch. And uh, it says he falls into a trance. So I'm not quite sure what that means, really. Uh, maybe he was like half asleep, half awake. It was sort of daydreaming. And uh, he has a dream. In fact, he has the same dream three times. And in this dream, a big picnic rug from heaven drops down and there's all these animals on it. And he hears the voice of God say, get up, kill and, and eat one of those animals. And Peter, being a Jewish man, uh, is shocked. And he says, no, Lord, I, I wouldn't eat anything that's unclean. And God very clearly says to him, do not call anything unclean that I have made clean. And he has this dream three times. And then the picnic rug gets picked back up, back up to heaven. And he's awake again. Now, I don't know if you've ever had dreams where... They just stick with you. The same dream maybe two or three times. Has anybody ever had that experience? Was it recurring? Be very open to God speaking to you uh, about, uh, about yourself, uh, about all sorts of things through those dreams. I had a, um, a situation where I had a similar dream. Well, the end of the dream always ended the same way, three or four times, uh, is that... Uh, whatever was happening, uh, I would end up at the end of this dream getting really angry and I would blow up in a rage at, at always the same person in the dream. And I would wake up and I'd be quite anxious and kind of go, oh, okay. I'd go, wow, that's weird. I don't rage at people. I don't shout at them. I don't respond like that. Well, after about the third time of me waking up and going, I don't do that. And God said, yeah, you do. You may not do that in the natural. You may not blow up and rage at that person, but you're harboring some anger. And I went, oh, wow. And I had to repent and had to really say to God, wow, forgive me. Show me how to, how to deal with that. So I encourage you, if you've had, there may be some of you here, actually, as I was preparing if you've had a recurring dream and maybe it's something that's it's irked you or just disturbed you, pray to God about it. If, if you're still not getting revelation on it, talk to one of your uh, pastors and leaders on it. Um, because God may be trying to point something out. Well, so God is certainly trying to reveal something very profound to Peter through this, but he doesn't get it straight away. Peter's kind of going, um, yeah, okay, maybe something's going on here. So while he's working this all out, Cornelius's guys turn up and they tell Peter the story and Peter goes with them. Um, Peter's a little bit hesitant. He says he's not, but he, he kind of is a bit hesitant. Um, and there's a reason for that, because Peter actually had some fears. He had some prejudices uh, towards these guys. Uh, they were not of the same ethnicity of, uh, as him. They were not of the same culture. And I want to suggest that in our world today, sometimes we do exactly the same. We don't think that there's prejudices there, but sometimes there are little things that we're harboring that we don't even fully acknowledge. Love has to be what motivates us. Remember when Jesus told the, the, the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan and the guys were questioning him and asking him, well, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, well, the first thing is love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. Put that but first. He says, but the first, that's the first one and the greatest commandment. But the second one is just like it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. We need the work of the Holy Spirit in order to, to fully love people. It's love that motivates us, not, not fear. Or prejudice. All right, so Peter goes with these guys. So it's another day traveling back. So a couple of days have passed now. And what we see in this last part of the story is that we have to, if we're going to be open to the Spirit, we have to let His Spirit move freely. We don't want to be hindered 
by things. We have to uh, let the Spirit move freely. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I love that verse. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We're not talking about freedom to do whatever you want and run wild and chaos. We're talking about free from sin, free from death, free from the things that bind us and hold us. So let's see what happens when Peter gets to Cornelius' house. When he gets there, Cornelius has had a couple of days, and he's gone to, I think he's probably gone to his 100 soldiers, he's gone to friends and family and neighbors, and he's just gone, guys, I don't know what's going on. I had this vision, this happened. This guy is going to come and talk to us, and you don't want to miss it. God is doing something. And as an influencer, he's got a whole stack of people that have turned up to his house to hear what Peter is saying. And that's like a red rag to a bull. If Peter sees a crowd, he starts preaching. So they kind of treat Peter a little bit like a god at first. He's treating him a bit like a king, kissing his feet. And, oh, Peter, we love you. And he's, he shies away from it. And he's like, no, look, you know, I'm not, I'm not like that. In fact, actually, what he says to them, have a look at this, verse 28. He says, now you guys are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile. But, you know, God's been showing me stuff about impure and unclean. So, you know, when when you guys came, I I came without raising an objection. I disagree with that, actually. I think he did raise an objection because he's just said it to their face. That's an incredibly rude thing to say. Yeah, I'm a Jew, you're a Gentile. He's he's really putting them down there. I don't want to have too much of a tough go at Peter but he's taking a while to get the message here so you what you know can I ask why you guys have sent for me well Cornelius says well you know what we believe that God's presence is here we can sense it we're open to hear whatever it is you have to say from God I mean wow his faith was incredible really I can't commend Cornelius enough and that's when Peter realizes how closed off he has been, how bigoted he has been, how he could have potentially missed this opportunity. And the Spirit kicks in and he starts to preach to them. Have a look at this. Verse 34, then Peter began to speak. He says, you know what? I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation, every person, the one who fears him and does what is right. It doesn't matter whether you're male, female, young, old, Jew, Gentile, the Spirit of God is for everyone. And see, that dream that Peter had was not about the animals. It was about seeing all people as clean before God. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The revelation shakes Peter up. He starts to preach the gospel. He starts to tell him about Jesus on the cross, about his resurrection, about the forgiveness of sins, about the power, the Holy Spirit power, that when Jesus went out and ministered and prayed for people, that they saw healings. They saw dead people come to life. They saw the miraculous. He's telling them all this stuff. And guess what happens? While he's still pre- uh, preaching, they start getting baptized in the Spirit. It's like they were just sitting there going, yep, 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 we believe Jesus, Son of God. Yep, we want, we want him in our life. And we want the Holy Spirit power as well. And have a look what it says in the next verse, uh, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Now, this is not the normative pattern for this in the new testament but it happened in this case the holy spirit came on them and and peter's friends the, the believers who had come with peter were astonished that the gift of the holy spirit had been poured out even on the gentiles but they couldn't refute it because they heard them speaking in tongues and praising god and prophesying they it messed with their theology but it was it was for real and peter says well pfft, who am I to argue? Let's just get them baptized in water as well, and, uh, and they can go the whole way. Now, that's where the story ends. We don't know what happens to Cornelius and his family uh, after this. We might assume that as a, a, century, uh, a centurion, 
um, that if he declared himself to be a follower of Jesus or, or, or the way, as they called it back then, um, that he probably lost his position in the Roman army. And that has implications for his family. It has implications probably for the soldiers that he led. On the other hand, I like to think, and this is not in the text, but this was happening all over the place. I like to think he became an influential leader in the first church at Caesarea. And that he was out there preaching about Jesus. And that he was getting people saved. And he was praying for their healing. And he was prophesying over them. And he was training up more disciples. And he was sending them out to do the same. Because that's what was happening all over the place in churches at that time. And it's still happening today. That is the New Testament pattern for churches. It's for people to be saved, to, to, um, to see the Spirit of God moving in their life, and to share that with others. It's what God wants to do for some of you here today. Being open to the Holy Spirit and overcoming fear and stepping out is not always the easiest thing to do. I understand that. But it is the right thing to do. And someone who I've watched uh, experience this many times over is Pastor Janet Bryce. And I want Janet to, to come now and share a little story. Um, I, I look up to Janet as a spiritual leader, as a worship leader for many years in our church, and, uh, and as the pastor of prayer here. I mean, she is just always praying and, and waiting on the Holy Spirit. And, um, but there's been times when it's been tough for you as well, and you've had to step out in, in faith. Sure have. Yeah. So share with us a little bit, Janet, about this experience. Thanks. As Pastor Nathan shared at the start of his message today, uh, the Holy Spirit is not spooky, but he is supernatural. And what the Holy Spirit does and brings to our lives is love. God has promised his spirit to every Christian, and Jesus encourages us in Luke 11 and verse 13. He says, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So I've come to know that the Holy Spirit is my comforter and my guide, and he prompts me to pray for specific people and things. And sometimes I follow his promptings, and sometimes I let them slip. He also asks me to be obedient to his calling, and this can be really painful if I resist. So let me share a story about this. And in this story, I see my husband, Philip, more like the Cornelius-type character, full of faith. And I was a bit like Peter, who took a little bit of... took a bit longer to get on board. In the early 1990s, there was a CRC church in Ranella whose pastor felt a move out of the leadership of that church and follow a teaching career in a Bible college. So Pastor Bill uh, was asked if the Christian Family Centre would take on the leadership of this church and uh, include it as one of our daughter churches. Bill felt this was a God opportunity. You can hear him saying that, can't you? And he asked my husband, Philip, if he would take on the role of lead pastor. Philip felt a strong call to this church and to ministry and was really excited about this next phase of ministry in his life. As his wife, I would accompany him and assist in any way I could. And our kids, who were eight and three at the time, would be part of this new venture too. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, I didn't feel the Holy Spirit say, go to me. I wrestled with this over two weeks um, because that's how much time Bill had given us to make a final decision. And I was pretty convinced that this was not the right thing for our family, but Philip felt it was. So I had to make peace with this and be obedient to what my husband felt was the call of God for him and us at that time. So why would the Holy Spirit lead Philip in one direction and me in another? Was I not listening to him? I don't think so. I had so much dialogue with the Holy Spirit in those two weeks and I came to the conclusion that I just needed to be obedient and to go. I trusted the Holy Spirit to lead me, so I needed to let him do just that. 
Was it hard? Yes, it was. Did God bless us? Yes, he did. We were involved in the leadership of that church for three years, and during that time, I grew more in my faith and my knowledge of the Holy Spirit than ever before. And one of the things I can see in that time was probably about 18 months into that three years, the Holy Spirit really placed on my heart to start women's ministry in the church, which there wasn't at the time. And that wasn't a natural thing for me. I didn't really feel that I could be the women's leader, but the Holy Spirit put it on my heart and we did start a women's ministry and we saw quite a few uh, women and girls come along, gather. Some discovered Jesus for the first time. Many were baptised in the Holy Spirit and many were set free from things that had held them back in the past and that's what the Holy Spirit does. The act of obedience, or this act of obedience for me, caused me to trust the Holy Spirit that he really does know what's best for me. And Proverbs uh, 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And, you know, sometimes the feelings aren't always there. And I really honour Janet. Yeah, let's put our hands together. I, I honour Janet, uh, you know, for her honesty and her obedience to God and uh, an obedience to follow, you know, her husband's, Phil's sense of, of what God wanted to do. And God used that. That ministry to those women would never have happened otherwise. What is the gift of God that is in you? that God wants to stir up and, and, and do something through you. It's not something that you need to be fearful of. It's to be celebrated. God, with his Holy Spirit, wants to do something incredible. Let's not miss what the, the Spirit is wanting to do. Let's not be overwhelmed by fear and, and prejudice and stifle the Spirit. Be like a Cornelius. Step out in faith. And when we step out in faith, God steps in with his power. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. I want to encourage you. Let's bow our heads and pray. And uh, this is an opportunity now for you to respond to God. So in your heart, just start to, to dialogue with the Lord. I don't know where you are on your journey of faith. Maybe you're just starting out. Maybe you've been a Christian many years. Maybe you en enjoy a great relationship with the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's something that you feel dry in and just as you reach out. In faith this morning, expect God's Spirit to fill you with the Spirit of the Lord as there is great freedom. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that, Lord, when we step out in faith, you step in with your Spirit. You overcome our fear. That when we step out in love, you overcome our prejudice and our bias. And when we step out in freedom, Lord, you change those closed hearts and minds to be opened. And Lord, the incredible takes place. Father, we thank you for that. And most importantly, we thank you for the death of your son, Jesus, and his resurrection to life. Because through it, we won eternal life in you, the gift of salvation. We have relationship with you. We have access to the Holy Spirit, all because of what Jesus did. Father, for that, we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.